Welcome to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere with your host, Chris Parker. And welcome back to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere. This is Chris Parker, and I'm having a conversation with Andre Verica, who is the chief reverse engineer, and we're going to have fun with that, for Start Reverse, and you can find them at startreverse.com. And he's been through, I think, a, a journey through Corona. I'm really fascinated to see um, how Start Reverse has, has, has come about in the last couple of months and what the ambition is for the organization. So, Andre, thank you for joining. Can you kick us off by sharing what is it that you do and why are you doing what you do? Thank you, Chris, for having me on the show. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and Start Reverse, uh, it's really a startup, but then with 34 years of history, and I guess we can talk about it a little bit later. Mm-hmm. What we do at Start Reverse is really reversing the way people learn, the way people lead, and the way people interact. Uh, and our purpose is to bring relevance to the world. Uh, so, in essence, we want to make sure that brands become more relevant to their audience. I think about hotel chains, airlines, uh, think about retail. I mean, retail for most has lost a lot of its relevance uh, over the past years. Uh, after all, I mean, you don't have to go to a store to buy stuff. Uh, we've seen that mm-hmm. uh, throughout the pandemic, yeah, that we can do very well without physical retail. But at the same time, we're missing something. And what that something is, is, is really our focus. And that's, of course, a meaningful experience. Why would you go to a store? So if you think reverse, that's where we start with brands. Why would people go to your store? Well, why is your hotel brand different and, and more meaningful than the others? Why would I choose to fly with A and not with B? So that's really what we focus on. And it's a lot of fun. And, and Andre, for yourself, why is this important? Because you've been uh, you know, basically investing in maybe this reversal of thinking or, or thinking backwards in a way for, for many, many, many years. Well, what is it about this that, that maintains your passion in, in helping organizations this way? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, a couple of decades ago, I think around uh, the millennium change, I noticed that more and more hotel brands and retail brands become copycats. I mean, there was so much commoditization. Uh, and, and I thought this is not how it's meant to be. I mean, why, if you walk into one hotel, why does it look and feel exactly the same as the other? And I have a background in hospitality management. Uh, I'm a great fan of retail as well and automotive. And I thought, guys, we need to do, we need to do better. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's, it's all about building a context that drives uh, meaningful experiences, uh, which is not easy. It's easier said than done uh, because context change requires also leadership transformation, uh, leading to a specific mm-hmm. culture that drives behavior that creates those experiences. But because it's difficult, maybe that's why I was attracted. Because it's easier to copy somebody else than to create something new. Um, I guess uh, maybe that's a bit uh, sadomasochism inside me. But I, 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 like, uh, I like to do things that are uh, constantly challenging. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, in your you know, decades of experience with this, um, does it come naturally to people? Meaning, is this something like, hey, if, if you think reverse and if you start reverse, is that something that you, that want, you know, once an executive sees it, they can't unsee it? Or is it something that they need to actually mature and grow into and, and get comfortable to, re- to realize that maybe their opinion of what the customer wants is, is perhaps different than what the customer is actually asking for? Yeah, you know, it's really different from, from leader to leader and brand to brand. Uh, you have certain brands that have already a context where people deliberately choose to work there. And they get it faster than others. Uh, but if I go on, on a leadership level, uh, I, I sometimes have interviews that within two minutes, there is this instant click and people get it. And uh, even CEOs, uh, I remember uh, the CEO of British Airways, 
uh, he was introduced by a friend of mine and he said to my friend, Frank, this is so bloody obvious. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was looking at Frank like, this is a good thing or a bad thing. And it turned out to be a good thing. Uh, and it's, it's often that the obvious in retrospect, uh, once it's there, it's obvious. So we have a blueprint approach yeah, where we start with uh, purpose and identity like yin and yang. And we do that now for 20 years, more or less really deliberately always start with what's your purpose and, and how do you want to be perceived? And the identity question is in one word, one job title, like a Virgil job title, you're capturing uh, basically who people are working for that organization. Like Google has Googlers, Starbucks has partners, uh, Citizen M has Citizen. Uh, so in, in case of Rove, Rove Hotels, they have Rovesters, and you can go on and something like that. Getting, nailing that one word in combination with the purpose already drives behavior big time. It's like all, already like automatically. And then I'd say a, a, a good majority of CEOs and board members get that. Uh, and, and some, they don't see it. They think it's a trick. Uh, and I've even had, I won't mention the brand, but had a very interesting experience Okay, so if we create a blueprint like that, and we have purpose and identity, and we have the intended experience and behavior working time with the that's a nice way of sort of compensating the pain that we cause uh, throughout the delaying and the restructuring of the organization. So no, but I mean, you, you can use it as a foundation and you can use it as a compass. And of course, it can be combined, but it's not like a sweetener. So that's what some mm. leaders see it. It's like, uh, it's not for real. And if it's not for real, and we come to a point, Chris, that if, if we come across uh, a leadership team that doesn't see this as for real, we challenge. And if we, after the challenge, it's still not for real, we won't take the job. So I guess that comes back to your purpose. Meaning, I mean, I guess if there's certain leaders or organizations that are violating some principle, maybe lack of authenticity, is that mm. is that maybe your primary driver, that, that authenticity? Or, or well, what is the criteria mm. that you would pass or play? Uh, the authenticity is, is crucial. Uh, and I think Joe Pine and Jim Gilmer wrote a cool book, uh, which is uh, uh, The Experience Economy, which was for me a game changer in my, mm. my looking at this thing. Uh, but they also wrote a follow-up book, which was called Authenticity. Yes, we need to create cool experiences, but they need to be authentic unless you're Disney or uh, the afterling in the Netherlands. Um, so I think, yes, authenticity is super mm-hmm. important because as a leader, uh, if you want to build a culture, so this blueprint process uh, consists of, on one hand, you have purpose, identity, the how and what. On the other part, well, let's say the right part, we call it, we have four boxes of how do you want to be experienced, uh, what behavior, what interaction drives the experience, and then you work your way down what working climate feeds those behaviors mm. and what leadership will help shape the culture, these four, four cultural pillars. Uh, and if it's fake, employees will immediately see if it says something like we are empowering, but if people don't feel empowered, they see through it. Mm. Uh, and, and then what, what's really worse, Chris, is that the good guys leave the first, and then yeah. you you get stuck before you know with shift survivors, people who do the job, who do the task, but don't live the purpose, and then you become a commodity. And we have so many brands that are basically without a soul. So maybe one of the biggest drivers is that we have is how can we give soul to brands? How can we bring brands to life? And that's mm. really through people interaction. Uh, which is a result of having uh, a stimulating culture and having an, an empowering leadership. Love it. I'm writing that down. Give soul to brands. Um, I love it. Just a, a, a side comment. I've, I have been able to talk to Joe Pine on the podcast. So uh, in the show notes, I'll put a link to that for people who want to learn more about the experience economy. Cause that, that is really something that, you know, as you know, with my, myself has, has been just, fundamentally transfer, you know, transformative as well. That's definitely, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, you mentioned that, that in, in, in times of, of lack of authenticity, 
you can lose the best people first. Um, have you also seen that people are using this uh, you know, start reverse approach in order to attract new uh, employees and contributors that are may maybe driven by the same values or mindset? Yeah, totally. Uh, and it's, it's a bit like uh, maybe a strange metaphor, but in sports, you also see the best athletes are the ones that train the most. And it's, mm -hmm. it's no coincidence. Uh, if you look at Ronaldo, uh, what does he do after a training? At the end of the training, he still keeps on training, taking mm -hmm. uh, free kicks, uh, penalties, and not because he sucks at it. He's bloody good at it, but he, he just he's driven to become better. Uh, and that's what you see with champions in retail, in hospitality, in aviation, in automotive. Uh, they are consistently working on improving themselves. And that's magnetic because then you also attract people who are like that. So the good become better and the best become champions. Mm. Um, having a blueprint, uh, which for instance, Le Pain de Gen is one of the brands we work for. And they wanted, and they're, they're hosts, which is their identity. You could say, well, that's corny. Or you could actually say, well, that's actually cool. Let's bring coolness back to being a host. And, and their purpose is to create meaningful connections. It has nothing to do with food per se. Uh, and one of the experiences they want to create is make people feel at home, but also make people feel trust. I can trust Le Pen Codigé. If I have an allergy, I can trust going there. If I say, hey, I'm, I'm really gluten intolerant, I'm out for 24 hours if, if I eat gluten, I can trust that brand. So if those are intended experiences and you have a movement like that, which is so outspoken, you actually can also then separate uh, really uh, the, the shift survivors from, from the experienced champs. People deliberately want to work for that brand because of their brand passions, because of mm -hmm. why they are, who they are, and how they want. Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest outcomes uh, in, in the past more or less a decade, is we actually use blueprints to cast. We cast people. We deliberately help brands to cast people like, like in the film industry, like in the theater industry. And not because we want actors, but we're casting them. We're putting them in, in extreme situations so we can actually have an access in, in the, the real black box of the individuals, like who they really are. Hmm. Uh, and it has not a lot to do with their skills or experience, but it has everything to do with their personality and attitudes. And if we find that, and if you find an optimal match between blueprint behaviors that you're looking for, uh, focused on the experience that you want to create and the intrinsic motivates of, of coworkers, and then it's fantastic. Then something really magical happens in general. Uh, you, you talk about casting and magical. You know, I think I think for me, one of my inspirations has always been uh, Disney. In this case, where you know they have the, the the casting centers, and yes, I have a Mickey Mouse tattoo that I'm not going to show you, but literally I have it because I've, I've I guess I've become that much of a fan. Um, uh, and so some of the other brands that, that you worked with, you know, IKEA, Nike, um, Adidas. You know, already mentioned Citizen N. Um, and, and I think the word you used was intended experience. Uh, I, I guess, is, is that is that the, the main message is, is to help them craft an intended experience as opposed to, which is commonly just an accidental experience? Is that is that sort of yeah. the, the root of it? Yeah, that's a good differentiation because the intended experience is, is the experience you want them to have. But then again, at the end of the day, uh, you cannot really uh, deliver an experience people have they undergo an mm. experience so it's not like it's the experience people will have because that's up to the individual that uh, you and me mm. can go through the same shopping mall and we can have different experiences you and me can go to the same hospital even speak to the same doctor because of your moods uh, you could have a different experience than me even if we have mm. the same disease or the same questions so an experience is really a person-to-person -person or multi-personal interaction. Um, with intended experiences, we deliberately say, these are the experiences we would love our customers to have. And if we consistently make sure that they have these experiences, then we have a big chance that they will actually become our fans. 
okay, which is one of the ultimate goals, of course, to turn customers into facts. And that starts by an employee experience. So the employee experience mm -hmm. will always say EX needs to be equal CX. So the employee experience should be the same as the customer experience. Meaning uh, that you want to be making sure that whatever you promise your customers is the first thing your potential stars, your potential co-workers or your current co-workers are experiencing every day in every interaction. Going back to authenticity, what you mentioned before. If not, then you're not authentic. You're not true to self. And I guess being true to self is 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 can be complicated because this you know do do you agree or do you have a different view that that isn't is the self of the organization the the uh, accumulation of the self of the individuals or can there be a, a, a higher self maybe a branded self how, how how do you connect true to self as an as a as a, as, a, as an organization compared to Mm. True to self as a as an individual human. Yeah, I think it's a layered uh, yeah. self. Uh, it's a blueprint so that that's like your your one pager uh, describing mm -hmm. brand essence, brand experience, and the way how to deliver that experience um, is on a brand level. And if you're not uh, living your purpose as a brand, if you're not li delivering on those intended experiences. You're not true to self as a brand. Mm -hmm. uh, but as leaders, for instance, we believe in epic leadership. And epic, in our case, stands for empowering, being purpose-driven, being inspiring, and coaching. If I say I'm, I, I'm an epic leader or uh, we believe in epic leadership, but I'm not purpose-driven, I'm not a good coach, uh, and, and maybe I suck at coaching and I'm transparent about it, that's okay. But if I pretend to be a good coach, but I'm not really taking time with my team, I'm not true to self. That's mm. on an individual level, how I see it. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's where that, that lack of authenticity comes in. If, you, know, uh, you know, you see organizations that, that take their value statements, put them on posters on the walls, and then do the exact opposite, which I think is even worse than doing nothing at all. So, um, okay. Uh, Andre, uh, start reverse. Who is who is the, the 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 best customer for you? So, so like if you're if because uh, you already have some glorious you know logos that you've worked with in the, in the past. Looking forward, um, maybe what's the dream of the perfect organization or buyer uh, for Start Reverse? Um, what we love to work with is leaders with ambition. So ideally, there's a great ambition. There is a gap between potential blueprints or current blueprints and today's reality. And so there's work to do. There is ambition. Uh, we have realistic timelines. Sometimes we meet uh, C-level who say, can we do this in three months? Sure, mm -hmm. we can get started in three months, but transforming a culture, mm -hmm. transforming coworkers into brand ambassadors or managers into epic leaders, it's a matter of two or three years before you can speak of, okay, we're starting to see culture. So ambition, there is a gap. There is, uh, let's say, patience or a real, realistic view on, on timelines. Uh, and, of course, uh, for us, super important, uh, it needs to be fun. Uh, and that's sometimes on a personal element, but it's really... Uh, probably also the main reason why we still work in hospitality and retail and automotive and aviation. Uh, in, in retrospect, it was the most legal choice to have uh, with the pandemic. Uh, I forgot tourism. We also work for tourism. So that was not a very good combination. But then again, these sectors are self so Um we, we also work for, uh, for instance, for uh, agencies, for tech companies, um, but then again, to really do a full journey, and we have a couple of exceptions in tech. Uh, there is uh, Atlantic Broadband in the US, there is Kojiko in, in, in Canada. Uh, there are telecom providers, but super cool people, ambitious leaders, and, and basically take all the boxes. Mm -hmm. And the people are really, really great to work with. 
So I think that that's the full picture. And then maybe, and that's not the most important one, uh, also having a realization that we need to invest. We need to invest resources in time. Uh, that is important, energy. And, and yeah, sometimes you have leaders uh, who have a huge ambition but don't have a budget. And we still see how we can help them. But if you talk about the ideal times, then also those, those boxes will be ticked. Yeah, you mentioned two to three years, and that in itself sounds like a, a, a hefty investment, if not financially, then just attention and focus and, and resource. Um, yeah. Does, your, does your, your perfect customer buy this on internal inspiration and, and belief of value, or is there an ROI debate that happens up front? Like, me, you know, that, does it make sense financially to do this? Yeah, we typically start smaller. Uh, we typically start, let's just do, let's create a blueprint. Uh, because mm -hmm. once we've got the blueprint and that's, uh, that's a one-day investment uh, with a core team, and then very often the need arises, we should do this with other people. Like in KLM, for instance, uh, we had one session with the, with the executive committee uh, and, and the boards, and then we had seven more sessions throughout the, the organization. KPN, same thing, started with the board, and then we had eight sessions with about 200 leaders, star performing coworkers. Uh, and then you have like within in, in one to multiple workshops, you come to a blueprint, which is carried by, let's say, a, a, a very good core team. They have your first guiding coalition. The, the, we call that the dream phase. Uh, the mm -hmm. second phase would be the de defined phase, whereby you say, okay, we got the blueprints, so what's the gap between the, the perfect future blueprints and today's reality? Uh, and part of the defined phase also is, so how do we actually uh, see where do we want to go? What does success look like in terms of timelines? Uh, what is our ambition uh, compared to whom? If you want to be the biggest, the fastest, the best, or the most appreciated, uh, make it more tangible. So we define KPIs. Um, and, and, you know, Chris, once you've got the blueprints, there is a hunger to know what's the gap. Once you know the gap, uh, an appetite is created. Uh, we want to do something about that gap. So then the design phase is very often automatically coming. And some clients say, hey, we, we, we'll take this on board and uh, we just consult their internal teams. And other clients, we do the full Monty. So we create completely designed the journey. Uh, fourth phase is direct, basically, leaders to own the change. And the, fourth, uh, the fifth phase is uh, to deliver, to make sure that everybody in the organization is immersed and activated and we come to sustain it. So it's not like the average client signs for a three-year program. Uh, it's, it's very often, it's a, it's a shorter intervention which grows uh, because of enthusiasm and appetite and, and, and belief. And every phase, we also say you can step out if, if you feel you want to do this yourself, uh, feel free. There's no obligation to work with us. Uh, the obligation is that it needs to be fun. And it needs to be relevant, uh, I think, from, from both sides. And if, if that's there, if it's, if it's engaging and relevant, uh, again, great things can happen. Yeah, fun and relevant. I love that. Um, I, I'm curious if you can unpack epic leadership a bit, because uh, the, the, the question that came up is, is sustainability. I mean, how do you really embed this in, a, in an organization for it to be continuously adopted, improved, and you know, enhanced and elevated? Um, is that why you focus on the leadership as, uh, as, as a mindset as well? Or, or how, does that, how does that fit in, the, this epic leadership dimension? Um, so it's not like every organization really has epic leadership, because if you think reverse from purpose and entity, you go to intended experience. And from the intended experience, you translate into behavior. Um, and then the behavior is translated into cultural pillars. And only then you look at, so what leadership behaviors will drive those cultural pillars? And uh, so in, in, in the reverse design, you don't automatically come to Epic. Epic is our generic program. Uh, so if a company says, hey, we don't want the entire blueprint, but we want to have a better experience, we have two programs. One is called Experience Stars, 
So how can you transform your, your co-workers into experienced stars who are surprising, touching, assisting, and recognizing? And the STAR is supported by the EPIC uh, leadership. So star behavior is, is triggered by EPIC leadership. Having said that, how did we come to EPIC? Uh, we've done over the years probably about 200 blueprints. And if you then look at the common denominators, you see most often empowering, coaching, inspiring in that order. And then lately more and more purpose driven is, is coming up. So people are more and more aware we need to lead with purpose. And you, you initially called it like a couple of decades ago, value-based leadership. Uh, and we still think value-based leadership is crucial. It's, it's you're building context. But uh, if you look at how it's defined in most blueprints as common denominators, Epic really automatically came out. And then we thought, okay, then we're onto something because in a generic approach, training uh, to become an empowering leader, purpose-driven, inspiring coaching, it works fantastic. So we have... I think about 40, 50% of our programs are now really on, on the generic epic leadership because there's so much proof that, it, that it's working, that it's effective. And we currently have four big brands that have like a full year rollout program that all their leaders need to go through a five module with pre-work, post-work epic leadership program. Very mm -hmm. intense for them. How long, how long does that five module program take? Is that, is that a... Yeah, if you want to do it fast, 10 weeks. Uh, if you want to do it realistic, I would take 10 months. Uh, and then you have more time to implement. So we combine it with a learning app. Uh, and, and we had one client doing it in overdrive, an automotive client. Uh, and, and really in 10 weeks, and then we got the feedback. This was really hefty. It was the most transformational program they had, but also very, very intense. But they were warned and uh, they wanted yeah. it anyway. And it, it, it's a pilot phase, so that's all good. Mm. Uh, but after the pilot, they will run it into a, a longer duration. Mm. Nice. I'd like to switch gears a bit and, and, and look back to you. And, and um, you, you mentioned before we started recording that the, the, the previous iteration of some of this, uh, these concepts um, lost relevance. And then, and then, then uh, a new approach, a new brand was was emerged from that. Can you share a little bit about that that personal journey and how did you? Um, my question is, how, how do you maintain your energy and your passion during Corona, mm -hmm. during business change? You know, um, it's been a crazy time for all of us. Um, how, what happened and how how do you keep going? That's a, a, a number of questions. Mm -hmm. Let me try. Um, first of all, Performance Solutions, uh, I founded uh, almost 34 years ago uh, and had its roots in, in hospitality, later automotive, so we're serving the same target audiences as now, but our focus very much was on spreading delight. That was our purpose. How do we make shopping fun? How do we make hospitality more fun and more delightful? Uh, and we were not, uh, let's say, too digital yet in our delivery. I think uh, probably less than 10% of our delivery was, was virtual. Then Corona came. Uh, and in, in March, within four weeks, we lost 95% of our revenue for the full year. Um, and I also knew at the time, uh, okay, maybe we're done with Corona in six months' time. I didn't think so, but people were thinking one October, maybe. Uh, but aviation, tourism, hospitality, uh, part of retail uh, was hit so hard by Corona that they would not be really uh, thinking about, okay, let's uh, improve our leadership or, or let's uh, see how we can make uh, our, our sh the shopping more fun. They're not waiting. Let's say uh, they're surviving. That uh, was my, my instinct at the time. So I decided to uh, really uh, completely change gears uh, and, and started Start Reverse, uh, which was a hefty period uh, because closing down a business of, that you build up in 33 years, uh, we had to actually have all the exit uh, interviews with the team via Zoom uh, with the insolvency lawyer at the time. Um, 
uh, closing down offices in Hofdorp in Frankfurt, uh, ending a partnership in Dubai. Um, so April, May were really a hell, I can tell you. Mm. But then again, um, if you're below ground zero, you then also have nothing to lose anymore. And, and I had a lot of time to think. So June, July, August, I used to build the foundation for the new company and thought, so if we lose our relevance uh, because of pandemic, I mean, look at retail. Retail has lost its relevance in so many ways because the pandemic also showed we don't have to go to stores anymore to go and buy stuff. I mean, we can just simply use our mobile phone uh, and have it between one hour or one day, have it in home. So um, that was a big, big change for many retailers. And I think many retailers don't still don't see the impact as it's really there. Um, if you look at hospitality, I think we talked about commoditization before. Uh, many hotels provide a bed, but that's not why hospitality should be there. It should be so much more. And then with the team, and I have about uh, I have a fantastic team to work with. Uh, about ten of my former colleagues are, are part are, are back at Start Reverse and uh, actually decided, guys, let's then also use the experience from the pandemic and, and focus on on relevance. So our purpose now is bringing relevance to the world, meaning how can we make retail brands more relevant and hospitality more relevant, more differentiated. Uh, how do we can can we help create meaningful experiences that help brands stand out? So that really, uh, I mean, has a got an incredible traction. So we went live uh, on September first. Uh, already had some pilot programs in the summer, uh, and that's a nice thing. I mean, we're a startup, like I said before, with thirty four years of network, thirty four years of experience, and we have thirty four years of of tools and stuff. And actually could then decide, so what do we take into the future and what do we leave behind? Uh, created fantastic partnerships. So that's uh, one of your questions, what drives me and what keeps me energetic. Uh, I'm, I'm having so much enjoyment in, in the startup uh, because I'm learning so much new. Uh, and we're, we're making new friends, uh, old partnerships, new partnerships, uh, which from a, a business perspective, only gives opportunities. So our growth is super fast. Um, we're, we're now, I think the main concern is how do we handle, uh, let's say, the traction that we're getting. So that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and on a personal front, I think that was your last set of questions. Um, it's really uh, also learning, I guess, the hard way uh, is really learning how to stay in focus, how to stay in balance. So we have a morning ritual uh, hiking or biking. So this morning I biked to work, which is 22 kilometers, which is fine. Uh, of the past months, I do about 10K uh, at least hiking per day, but then every day. There's no exception. Mm -hmm. uh, and it almost becomes like a mantra uh, to get my head clean because I had to really, of course, in the transition, deal with. Uh, with a lot of, of emotional uh, impact. Uh, but all I think it's all turning out and has turned out for the good. And then uh, four fantastic kids, uh, a lovely wife. Uh, mm. So that's, uh, I mean, the family front also does wonders uh, in combination with fantastic team and partners. So uh, all good. I'm a happy camper. I'll get a very happy camper. I'm curious, the last question for me is, is uh... Uh, what's next? Meaning, meaning, what's the big ambition with with Start Reverse? Is it is this, you know, you 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 started on September first, had, had you know, uh, brought some things in from the past, and what is what does the next year or five years look like for you? Yeah, for me, the idea is uh, with the team to really share our insights, our experiences on on a global scale. So we're growing a network of associates. Uh, so Trolls just joined us from Norway. Uh, Dirk was the first to show us uh, in the Netherlands. We have Ulf and Jason in Germany. Uh, we have Jorn in Australia. We have Fong in Vietnam. And we're talking to a handful of uh, associates currently in, in different countries. So the next five years, I'd like to have associates in 40 countries. 
and the, the STAR and EPIC programs, uh, we're really looking for a couple of hundred certified facilitators to, to just have fun with those programs and run it in, in those areas. That would fill me with pride that we are actually able to share uh, the knowledge and the experience that we have rather than just keeping it in, in a very small camp. Love it. Love the ambition. Also, the model. You know, so your associate model. You can you can build out and scale that. You know, almost indefinitely. I think. Um, yeah. If if people are are interested in in, in discovering more, uh, getting you know, getting soul uh, back in their in their brand and making more of an intentional experience, uh, there's startreverse.com. Um, is that the best way to learn more, or is there, is there uh, um, other ways to discover? Uh, what Start Reverse can do for them? Yeah, startreverse.com gives you a lot of insights on the website, but we're also on Instagram at start uh, underscore reverse, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, there's probably a good, in, good doses of information as well. Uh, DM, always possible, simply to, to myself, and mm -hmm. happy to help. Yeah, well, I've, I've been watching that. Um, that's how we, you know, we met a number of years ago, but I've been watching this sort of um, rebirth or this, 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 this new thing happen. I was like, oh, wait, not. Andre's on, you know, there's some energy going on over there. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm delighted to see uh, uh, how much is going on and where it's going. So, uh, Andre, thank you so much for joining. This has been uh, delightful, uh, reconnecting and, and discovering what you're working on. Great to see you again, Chris, and, and good luck with your shop. Thank you for listening. Like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player and download the Simplicity Kit from ebullient.com.